Thank you, Kevin, and uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, before we jump into what promises to be a very interesting and exciting panel discussion, I just really wanted to, to set the scene in um, literally about 30 seconds. I think, really, when we think about decarbonisation, the one message I want to try and convey is that we have um, an increasingly diverse uh, landscape of decarbonisation. We have the very base level at the bottom of the pyramid, the IMO requirements around EEXI, CII, which obviously it's to be hoped everyone is going to comply with. But that's not, I think, where the picture stops. You then have you know, further levels of that pyramid around voluntary initiatives such as the Poseidon Principles, the Sea Cargo Charter, that incentivise and place a certain commercial value on going, on going further. If you want to serve Sea Cargo Charter uh, commitments, uh, Sea Charter cargo signatories, cargoes, you'll need to have a certain level of compliance at least over the course of the year within your fleet. Um, we also have some corporate commitments going further. Um, I didn't want to draw out any specific companies, but we look at the commitments, say, of an Anglo-American wanting to cut its absolute carbon emissions by 40% uh, by 2030 with a growing cargo book um, and going net zero by 2040. You can see, again, there's greater, there's greater levels of ambition than, than you see. We've also got the potential to be putting actual uh, dollars against carbon, uh, carbon costs uh, under the EU ETS and the Fuel EU. Uh, I won't spend any time going into those, but again, this is now translating into actual financial results. And probably the most ambitious is the green corridors, trying to create trade, trade flows or trade routes which are exclusively served by green fuels, and, and the most advanced of these, of course, is, is the Silk Alliance in Southeast Asia, um, which LR has been very involved in. So um, I know my colleague Ahila is here, um, who'll be happy to answer any, any questions that anyone has around green corridors more generally, or the Silk Alliance specifically. Um, so with that, I think it's time to, to jump it straight into the panel. I think I'd like to hold this idea of uh, shipping facing a tiered future with different levels of ambition uh, possible for, for different ship owners. Um, I won't uh, introduce my panel, take long to introduce my panel. I'll ask each panel member briefly in mo no more than three sentences uh, to introduce themselves and uh, just to describe what their company is doing around decarbonisation to support the decarbonisation of the shipping industry. So with that, Ege, would you like to start, please? Thanks for that, James. Um, so, uh, again, actually, so Newport Group, we focus predominantly on uh, services of dry docking, retrofit, uh, maintenance, repair, conversions, with a low carbon focus. Uh, in 15 yards around the world, uh, 30, 30 docks capable of handling approximately 2,500 slots <clears throat> annually uh, of all classes and sizes. We're all, we also provide the flexibility in payment terms to ensure we alleviate some of the cash flow pressure for our clients. We're able to extend project payments up to 24 months for repairs and maintenances, and obviously longer for um, retrofits. On the retrofit side, um, the, we, we focus on LNG first, uh, and the reason for that is due to its global availability at scale, uh, safety record, established infrastructure, and existing advantages uh, such as energy density, which gets uh, omitted from uh, discussions quite often. Uh, we also offer a pathway to zero carbon through LNG retrofits, starting with your uh, regular LNG, which can save up to 23%, um, reducing with bio LNG up to 80% and 100% down to zero uh, carbon while to wake with synthetic LNG um, as they become more broadly available. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. I, uh, thank you, uh, Anthony Gurney, Ardmore Shipping. Um, two, uh, probably three years ago, uh, we just started you know, realizing that uh, not only was the regulatory landscape going to change, but, but our, our whole business model uh, over time would, would have to change as well, given the business we're in. So we developed what we call our energy transition plan, which has three key focuses. One is technologies around fuel efficiency and eventually future fuels. Second is long-term projects. And the third is, uh, is sustainable cargoes, which is the direction we want to head. 
Uh, so far, our focus has been mainly on fuel efficiency improvements, uh, but we're you know working on all three areas. We have made a a, uh, uh, a kind of a side investment in a company called Element One, uh, which we think um, has a really interesting technology to apply to to make fuel cells work on on board ships. Thank you, Tony. Martin, please. My name is uh, Maarten Lodewijk. I uh, work for Value Maritime. And Value Maritime produces uh, plug-and-play exhaust gas cleaning systems with carbon capture. Uh, and one of our customers is also uh, Tony <laughs> and with Armour. So um, uh, with questions uh, why he choose our system, he, he can explain more. And, uh, and we're doing so. And by June this year, we have 20 vessels with carbon capture in Northwest Europe and, uh, and running that. Christian, please. Yeah, my name is Christian Richli, MPC Capital, uh, based in Germany. We are an investment asset manager, having about uh, three billion of shipping assets under management at the moment, uh, predominantly container ships. Um, we are the largest shareholder in MPC container ships, listed on the Oslo Stock Exchange, the largest container ship feeder owner. And uh, decarbonization is basically everywhere on our agenda. We have already ordered methanol powered new buildings. We invested in clean fuel tech companies and do a lot of retrofits, so a lot of topics to cover. Thank you, thank you. Um, Tony, maybe can we start with you, and could you talk a little bit around, uh, sort of as a ship owner, how much you can do and how far you can go in terms of decarbonization without a firm commitment from a charterer, and in terms of sort of the sort of percentage savings you think you can achieve on some of your vessels, and then how much further you can go with a charter of commitment, if you could help explore that a little bit. Yeah, I think, unfortunately, you can't go very far without, without a long-term commitment. Um, the reason why is that the regulatory framework doesn't yet exist to level the playing field between the traditional fo fossil fuels and the future fuels that we need to eventually adopt. That's of critical importance. Uh, can't happen overnight. It's going to take a long time. And I think we're also, uh, I think, at risk of overlooking the fact that somebody's going to actually have to make the fuel. Yep. Uh, which is a huge, huge issue. It goes beyond shipping, and it's going to take a long time. Um, with a long-term commitment, you could build a ship that, that is ready to burn those fuels, mm. not simply ready to convert, but actually able to burn. Uh, of course, there are uh, fuels like methanol that are produced in quantity today that could be used um, and are used on some ships. Uh, that could be very interesting. Uh, I think it has some merits even if you're uh, burning uh, brown methanol. Understood, understood. And I mean, in terms of sort of retrofitting energy saving devices to existing ships, mm -hmm. is that something that, uh, or how ambitious, obviously there's, you, there's certain things you can do, how ambitious can you be without, without that level of charter commitment? Uh, well, I think um, you can be quite ambitious. Um, I think a couple points to make about it is that it does take time. It's literally, you know, we're at a certain stage now that's taken us years to get to, uh, not months. Um, and it's, uh, uh, I think you have to think about these things as a package. You also have to have a system that's able to actually measure performance improvement to convince yourself that it's worth doing and that you're getting a return on the investment. There are things that we can retrofit uh, that we are doing. For example, now we were very excited uh, to, uh, to come across uh, Value Maritime and, and the product that they have, which is really a second generation scrubber system, which is modular. It, uh, it actually, fill it, the, the, the water flow over the side is at a lower pressure and it's about one third the flow, requires a lot less energy to run, it filters and neutralizes the uh, discharge. Um, and, and of course you can then uh, take advantage of the lower cost uh, uh, fuel oil available. Uh, but I think critically, and I think what we're most excited about is the fact that for the very little incremental cost and effort and time, you can convert it into a carbon capture system. So that whenever, uh, you know, at some point in the future when that becomes feasible, uh, we hope to be a first mover. Thank you. Um, Christian, t Tony expressed a little bit the, the challenges of doing things without um, charter support. I think it probably for a container ship charter owner, you're often perceived as being at one end of the spectrum. You know, as, as a tonnage provider, you provide the tonnage, the liner companies make, make the, 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 the decisions around that tonnage. Um, is that your perception? And I mean, how much can you do it M MPC container ships without the, the backing of the liner companies themselves? Um, first of all, I think that, you know, because all of a sudden operating profiles matter also to us and, and also the MPC container ships, um, the dialogue between the operators, the lines, and, and ourselves uh, has intensified a lot and is a lot more uh, straightforward and 
um, um, yeah, it helps a lot to, to improve really on, on both sides, I think. And um, we, we've done a lot already, and usually there is a share um, between amongst us, right, how, how we do it actually. And it starts with micro boilers, it starts with LED lightning, and and could continue with paint, uh, silicon paints, and you end up maybe with bulbous bows or propellers. Um, I think the reality and how you share it and what you actually would do yourself very much depends on, on the commercial framework. And, and that's already been uh, mentioned here, uh, how far the commitment is. If you have a longer charter, obviously, the, the, there is more uh, incentive, obviously, on the liner company to do something and to take a larger share in these retrofits. If that's not the case, then um, it's probably us who have to do something, and then we're lacking a bit of the regulatory framework, which we which we all need. Um, but aside from maybe the penalty, depending on our CI rating, we already do see and expect that there will be a multi-tiered market uh, going forward. And then for for us as an, as an owner and manager, you, you have already enough uh, incentives to do something yourself to improve your CRI, because I'm absolutely convinced that if the ship's re-delivered out of a charter and you have a E rating uh, instead maybe of a B or C rating, it will have an impact on the value of your ship. It will have an impact on your future employment options. So there is definitely incentive for us as well um, to improve that and, and to do things like I mentioned earlier. And um, I mean, I think that covers the uh, existing vessels. When you come to, to new buildings, is uh, how close is the dialogue with the liner companies, and uh, to what extent are there other initiatives you can take about new buildings that don't necessarily entirely rely on, on the liner companies themselves? I think um, I can only echo what was mentioned, and you need long-term commitment, and, and that's what we've done, right? And if we look at our new buildings, um, I think, first of all, container shipping is, in, to that extent, a bit of a different animal because you have a very, very high predictability of the trade routes. You know where the ships will be trading for a very long time, and that also means that the infrastructure investments for fuels, for fuel supply, for all of that uh, are fairly limited. And what we are seeing in, in container shipping is really that the push is coming from the end users these days. It's really um, the, it's an industry which is very close to the consumers, and that's the reason why there is probably more pressure than in other sectors. Um, what we have done, for example, when we look at our methanol ships, they come with a 15-year charter, it's a very long commitment, by North Sea Container Line, but the interesting part is that this charter is backed up by the end user, by the shipper, that's the cargo owner, in our case it's Elkem, it's a Norwegian industrial, global market leader in silicon products, and they are committing to that uh, new fuel, to the, to, the new, to the new ships, and we're really building top of your pyramid on the, uh, on the on the ambition, we're building a green corridor. But as I said, that's uh, up and down trading the Norwegian coast. The ship are turned around in, in, in Rotterdam and Hamburg. And I think that's the kind of pilots which uh, we will see. And if you're able then to source the green methanol, which is the only scalable green fuel available today, um, I think it's a very, very interesting uh, opportunity. And, and, and for us, in, in, in container shipping, or especially at MPC and MPC container ships, um, we have derivative ag decided against a strategic patience. We think that this is a fantastic business opportunity, and uh, we're going to continue on that path. Sure, thank you. Um, Ege, can I, can I turn to you um, talking about uh, retrofits of vessels and so on and so forth? Um, I mean, what level of, of interest are you, are you seeing from owners, and what are the sort of barriers that you sort of perceive? to seeing uh, you know, greater ship owner ambition in, in, within the retrofit market itself? Um, look, uh, we're not getting enough requests, for sure. Um, so I am sympathetic um, to the lack of one clear solution uh, for everyone and the ambivalence of the owners, operators to make that CapEx commitment, um, especially with you know, uh, regulation becoming more restrictive. But we do offer a broad set of solutions, uh, including expertise, engineering, uh, designs, choice of yards, uh, to a full financing package. Um, you know, request a quote, speak to us, so we can solve together what is presently addressable. Um, in terms of, um, I don't know if you said savings, but the precursor to savings is um, to be able to operate effectively. Now, I want to pose another question here. Can you afford not to retrofit your existing tonnage that is suitable? for it. When your clients stop using your services simply because they have 
they have revised their sustainability requirements because unfortunately I don't think you will be you will have a lot of input into those decisions you will only hear them so um, in terms of what we look for um, just to highlight that as well what we look for is probably up to 12 years of age and uh, we have defined we've looked at the list of uh, merchant vessels out there about 40 percent of the existing units uh, of box and tankers uh, are suitable for our uh, LNG retrofit designs, which we have uh, approvals in principle from DNB as well as uh, Bureau Veritas for. No, I laugh. Um, uh, Martin, I think, um, uh, firstly, you, you probably owe Tony a beer for that uh, sales pitch he gave for your, for your system. Um, but, uh, I mean, c can you tell us a little bit more about, um, you know, how you see, what you see as sort of the, the optimal vessel for your system. Is that is that going to be a retrofit? Is that going to be a new building? Um, how old do you think, what do you think the maximum age of, of vessel to which your your system could be economically retrofitted to? Uh, can you give us some details of it, on that? Well, uh, whether we like it or not, we still have 60,000 fuel oil driven vessels where we, we have a production capacity worldwide of uh, around 2,500 and we don't have a real solution yet. Uh, what to choose. So we need to do something with the vessels we have now. Uh, they're relatively old, uh, these vessels, because uh, less investments after 2008. Uh, and, and that's what, what our product is good at. Mm. It's uh, installing an easy plug-and-play system uh, where you can uh, yeah, decrease the environmental footprint of your, sis of your vessel and, uh, and also uh, improve the economic lifetime of the vessel and uh, running it, uh, it properly and well. And the system itself has also its economic lifetime itself where you can extract the vessel, uh, unit again and place it on a new, uh, new vessel if needed. So, uh, the, and then if you look at new builds, yeah, we, we also yeah, just did four uh, new builds where we yeah, uh, uh, post yard install uh, the unit. And uh, yeah, that's also, and, and there, I, what we see there, is that owners choose for dual fuel methanol, where where the, you have the optionality in the future to capture uh, the carbon and bring it back to the green methanol plants to produce energy efficiently and cost effectively the green methanol. That's what we believe in 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 the far future. So, uh, yeah. Understood. Understood. I guess um, I want to come back to, to Tony and the the, the charter question a, a bit more. Um, uh, I mean, Christian mentioned some of the sort of shifts that you've seen in containers being driven by, by the end users in terms of sort of uh, uptake of decarbonization. Can you talk a little bit about your customers, some of the sort of the, the discussions, the levels of ambition that your customers have now, and maybe how those have changed over the past three years or, or so? Well, I think, I think for our customers, like, like the rest of us, we're waiting for regulatory direction at least. Uh, and so uh, I think they, uh, I think we all want to do the right thing. Yeah. Uh, is it economically feasible is the question. I think a lot of the, in the tanker sector broadly, th there have been a number of LNG uh, new buildings. Uh, I think there are some methanol uh, powered projects as well. Um, but I think it's fairly, it, it seems to me like the, uh, the market leaders are car carriers and then container ships. Mm. <clears throat> and do you see the sort of the block on that uptake? How much of that is um, regulatory uncertainty? How much of that is technological uncertainty around fuel? How much of that is lack of technological readiness? Simply speaking, you know, the, the first ammonia engine we're going to get. I, th I think they're all linked, mm. uh, but we've got to have the regulatory framework first because once that is set, then everything else will follow. Mm. And yes, we're not there quite yet with ammonia. We are with methanol, uh, other other technologies, etc. But uh, and and. There'll probably be some diesel, you know, similar to diesel type of fuels that you can burn in existing engines. But the point is, you, you have to have the framework to level the playing field in order for all this to happen, and it's going to take a long time. Understood. And um, Christian, I think, um, you know, as, as Tony said, it's going to take time for these, uh, that regulatory alignment, that's really important. Um, could I just clarify? Please. The regulatory forward. alignment should happen tomorrow. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. All, yeah. all of the technological development, the future, the f uh, fuel, uh, you know, um, access to, to uh, green uh, renewable fuels, mm. uh, and then the, uh, the, you know, the gradual building of a fleet capable of using it. 
that's going to take time, but the regulatory part should happen tomorrow. Um, I, I, I agree it should. I think um, one thing is a clear regulatory pathway. I think the uh, second thing maybe is a high ambition regulatory pathway. And I think that the speed at which we may hit that high ambition regulatory pathway probably isn't, isn't as quick as, as some people in the industry at least would, would, would like to see, um, unfortunately, I, I, I'd suggest. Um, and I mean, I, I guess in that context, Christian, um, my, my question to you would be, how far do you think the container industry can go without that regulatory pathway? When we look at the green corridors, you mentioned uh, one within um, uh, Norway. D to what extent do you think over the next five years or so we'll start to see the uptake of, of green corridors within certain areas of shipping or, or, or indeed is the theory of change more led by the line of companies and their end users? So it won't be geographically specific. Instead, it will be Heineken or Ikea saying, we would like to ship our boxes zero carbon, and it will be led by a specific liner company. I think they would all like to ship their boxes uh, carbon neutral to mm. the extent they can, but they're not willing to pay for it. That's, the, uh, that's usually the issue if we have some of the discussion at least. And, but I see that the trend is changing a bit, um, as I mentioned before, and I mentioned the example of the Elkham. And uh, we see bigger groups uh, such as COSEF in, in the US and others um, creating buying alliances. I, I'm sure you've heard about it. Um, and, and they are pushing this a bit. And uh, there is more, um, more pressure definitely on the liner companies um, to come up with the products. And uh, we heard earlier about the, the split of, of MSC and Maersk in the, in the 2M alliance from 2025. And you'll see the different strategies between these companies, right? Maersk focusing on these products, being able to provide carbon neutral transportation on their methanol powered new buildings. MSC taking the opposite uh, uh, approach. And it will be interesting to see if there is enough demand uh, for that. But uh, without the regulatory uh, improvements and, and, and the clear clear framework, um, I think it, it will take much longer. So we, we need that. And uh, at the moment, we see Europe uh, being a bit of a f uh, front runner there. Um, the ETS, if it would have been uh, introduced at the beginning of this year, um, I think we all would have to scratch our heads a bit how we actually deal with it, because that's, that's the next issue. But it would definitely uh, help to um, yeah, source capital and, and initiate a few more ships uh, which are carbon neutral because essentially the conventional fuels are becoming more and more expensive and that's what we foresee for the next uh, couple of years, especially in Europe. And um, yeah, then the, the other sector where we see a lot happening at the moment is the US and uh, you're all aware of the Inflation Reduction Act which is uh, an enormous boost for ammonia production. You essentially paid to produce ammonia. And uh, I know a lot of companies are working on it. We are looking at it. We are fuel agnostic, and I'm sure we will see that the ammonia issues on board, and I agree it's highly toxic and I know about all the implications, they will be solved um, by our industry in the next couple of years. The first engines will be available in 2024, 2025 latest, and uh, there will be uh, the next step, I think, from, from that direction. Understood. Understood, and, and, and uh, Ege, we've, we've touched on a few of the different sort of drivers around EU ETS, around CII, so on and so forth. When you talk to owners about retrofits, what do you think the most, the driving factor for them is? Is it future regulation? Is it current regulation and compliance? Is it high ambition? Look, I, I think they're, they're all, they're all it's, it's a mix of things, but, but I suspect what is really standing in the way is that big CapEx requirement. Um, we're able to help there. Um, you know, we have we have this uh, business model in repairs where we're able to you know defer up to seventy percent of the project cost. Right? Uh, we're we're working on a similar model, uh, including financiers, and financiers are more um, excited about this because it is a bigger amount. You know, uh, raising fifty million is a little easier than one million dollars. Right? Um, and at the same time, it is it, it fits into their transition framework. Uh, it may not be completely green as of yet, but um, so w we can alleviate some of that pressure. Uh, again, collaboration is very, very important. Uh, we all need to speak to each other a lot more frequently, I think. Understood, understood. Two minutes. Okay, in that case, I will uh, instead go around um, the table, not ask the question I was going to ask, 
but instead just in one sentence, um, can you tell me what you would like to see happen in the industry uh, in the next year that you think would help decarbonize? Everyone is gonna say regulation and consistent regulation. So beyond a consistent regulation, what's the one shift that you'd like to see? Is it, is it technological? Is it commercial? Um, is, it, is it, you know, uh, a wider coalition of action forming? What, what would you like to see? And I guess maybe if we can start at the far end with, with Christian, what would, you, what would you like to see to help the industry decarbonize? I think I'm not allowed to say regulations. So I, I think it, what we really need is a, a global framework to assess the full environmental impact of each and every fuel, to be able to compare them, on a f and that really needs to cover the full life cycle, meaning well to wake. That's what we're lacking at the moment. Okay. Martin. Yeah, I agree that. Uh, also, cooperation between charters and owners and suppliers, in our case, where we work all three in uh, improving the footprint of the vessel itself. Yeah. Uh, just for owners to wake up to the value of a package of retrofits that provide a terrific return on investment um, and reduce the carbon footprint. Okay. Yeah, I, I agree with all of that. Uh, I call those, uh, you know, closer collaboration. Um, if you have a vessel that is uh, roughly in line with the uh, retrofit requirements, get in touch with us, others, and let's make shipping an inspiring case for how an entire industry can decarbonize. Fantastic sentiment. I don't know, have we got time for a question from the floor, Kevin? Nope, we're done. All right, thank you very much, everyone. <laughs>